problem is that now the West is in fact prisoner of its own narrative. Today, if we come to a negotiation, we see that it's not the case of a victory of, of Ukraine and a defeat of, of Russia. How much longer can the war in Ukraine last? And how much longer can the West offer support? Those are questions that Jacques Baud can answer. Welcome, Jacques. Thank you. Good morning. You have some pretty impressive credentials. You're a former colonel in the Swiss intelligence services, a specialist in Eastern European countries, and former head of the United Nations Peace Operations Doctrine. As part of NATO, you were involved in programs in Ukraine, particularly during the Maiden Revolution in 2014. And you're the author of three books on Ukraine, the latest of which, Ukraine Between War and Peace, is now out in English, published by Max Milo Editions. So thank you for talking about all of this. It's quite, quite interesting. For Ukraine between war and peace, you draw on information from Western intelligence services and American documents leaked in April 2023. You also have a battlefield perspective because of your involvement with NATO and, and other things. So in your involvement with UN peace operations and with NATO, um, can you give us an assessment of the war at present, some 18 months after the invasion? What, what's going on? How do we believe it? Well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned my sources. Um, in my book, I tried to avoid to take Russian sources, not because they are not reliable. In fact, if we look ex post, we can trust them more than, than the uh, Western uh, sources. But the idea was to show that all the information we need or we would like to have to stop this conflict is available in the West. In my book, I take sources from Western intelligence, as you say, from the leaked documents is one example, official documents, or Western documents, documents from the Russian opposition, and documents from the Ukraine press, Ukrainian press, meaning that I mean, on the Kiev side. And with that, if we read carefully, and if we put things as they are presented, not trying to create a narrative around this, you have a much better understanding of the war. So the thing is that today the, the West has created a narrative, in fact, to support this war. The idea in early 2022, and in fact, I should even say before that, because uh, if we listen to Alexei Arestovich, who used to be one of the closest advisors to Volodymyr Zelensky, he explained in 2019 in an interview to the Ukrainian TV that this conflict, the conflict we are witnessing today, had to take place. And it had to take place in 2021 or 2022. And it had to take place for a simple reason. Ukraine, since the late 90s, contemplates the idea of belonging to the European, let's say, community at large, in, in particular to the European Union. But to access the European Union, you have to go through NATO. And to be part of NATO, you need to have no, uh, let's say, conflicts, ongoing conflicts. And in, in 2019, Ukraine had a conflict in the Donbass, which was created, by the way, by some domestic law against uh, the, the minorities. We can go maybe into details uh, later, but without going into the details, this in domestic conflict led to a conflict which was political, by the way, more than uh, physical with Russia. The problem is that the previous government before Zelensky, they used to say that they had a physical conflict. That means that they had troops, Russian troops, in Donbass and things like that. Meaning that, essentially, Ukraine was at war 
And so Ukraine couldn't belong to NATO. So the idea was to have a conflict, and that's explained in very bluntly by Arestovich. The idea was to have a conflict, to trigger a conflict with Russia, and to defeat Russia. So Russia would be, basically would disappear from the political and strategic landscape, and then Ukraine could enter NATO without any problem. That was the idea. And you know, it is explained in plain words. I'm not making up uh, something. So that was the idea. And that's the reason why in 2021, the Ukrainians started to prepare an offensive against the Donbass in order to provoke the Russian, because they knew that if they would intervene militarily into the Donbass, Russia would respond. And that's exactly what, what happened. There was a law published in March 2021 by Zelensky ordering the conquest of Crimea and the south of the country. And based on that law, and actually a few days after the law was published, you, should, you could see a, a build-up of the Ukrainian forces at the border of Donbass. And that's why you had early April 2021 as a response to that, probably as a kind of deterrence strategy, Russia started to build up its own forces at the border with Ukraine. And that was the start of this conflict that we witnessed during the whole 2021, which eventually broke up in uh, February 2022, Ukraine would be at war with Russia, but not very long. Because as Arestovich explained, and by the way, that's also explained by another document, which was published by the Rand Corporation, uh, which is the Pentagon think tank, basically, since uh, 1949 or something like that. In a document that was published in March or April 2019, the Rank Corporation explained this strategy. It's explained in, in plain words. I mean, it's a 300 pages document that explains how you, uh, Russia would be defeated by sanctions and uh, you know, all that. And this war was supposed to be very short because the idea was that massive sanctions, isolation, political isolation of Russia on the world scene, plus the limitation on export and things like this, would just suffocate Russia within days. And that's the reason why Zelensky enter, entered this, this crazy process of starting a war, because he was convinced, and I think as many uh, uh, Western leaders, they were convinced that this conflict would last only a few weeks. The problem is that Russia was better prepared economically, militarily, and also probably in the, in the mindset of the people, if you want, to this conflict. And that's the reason why, why this conflict lasts longer than expected. You seem to be saying um, that Zelensky basically taunted Russia into making the move in February of 2022. Obviously, it hasn't gone the way he or the West expected. I mean, Russia seems to have an inexhaustible supply of men and arms. Just the proliferation of shells and bombs that they put out in a year is three times the amount that NATO countries make in, what, I don't know, three it's times in a year. So can Western countries continue to compete with, with Russia? What, what don't we know here? No, that's, that's, that's a problem. We, the West entered this conflict uh, in 2022 with a completely wrong or false idea of what Russia was. We had, and that's, that's very interesting because if you look at the, the TV programs we had, especially in France, Belgium, Switzerland, and so on, you could see that people compared the Russian economy to the, the economy of Italy or Spain. 
But the problem is, and the main difference is that if you look at uh, nominal GDP, that's probably true that you had this, this similar amounts. But there is a fundamental difference. Russia had no debts, while Italy or Spain or France or almost all the United States and, and others have an incredible debt, meaning that the, the debt is the vulnerability. If you start to isolate, to sanction, to uh, yes, isolate a country from the rest of the world, if it has debt, it will fall within days because it, it cannot absorb the, the suffocation, so to say. But if the country has no debt, that means it is in a kind of autarky, then is almost un invulnerable to sanctions. And that's exactly what happened. So we, that, that was the, the, the first mistake. The second mistake is that we misunderstood the resilience of the Russian industry. You mentioned the artillery and the, the, uh, the number of rounds fired. According to the Royal United Services Institute, which published a, a study a very recent couple of weeks ago, it explained that last year, that means 2022, Russia fired 12 million, 12 million pieces of ammunition, I mean uh, uh, artillery ammunition. And that the, the, the yearly capacity of production is two and a half million. In the US, the capacity, the production capacity is, was, let's say, last year, early uh, this year, it was something like 15,000 rounds of ammunition of artillery per month, 15,000. Now, uh, the, the, uh, because of the, uh, the war in Ukraine, they have uh, stepped up the production and now they probably reached, reached something like 25,000 per month, per month. But the Russians publish, <laughs> produce 10, uh, uh, 10 times, or no, no, 100 times that, that, that amount per year. So we are far away from, uh, from uh, uh, the, 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 the capacity of the, the, Russia, the Russians and uh, the West is, is totally different. And that's the reason why uh, now <laughs> the Western countries start thinking about how to end this story. Well, there are serious conversations certainly going on in Washington now about how much longer they're going to put money together. Um, do, we, do we think that U.S. weapons and military aircraft are making a difference in this war? Because no. the, I mean, the counteroffensive seems to have stalled, at least. No. You know, Ukraine started the war with something like 2,000 armored vehicles, armored fighting vehicles, including tanks and, and infantry fighting vehicles and all that more than 2,000, actually. And now we are providing how much? 30 Abrams tank, 80, uh, I think now they have about, yeah, around 80 uh, Leopard 2 uh, German tanks. I mean, we are talking about an order of magnitude which shows that we are not able, the, the Ukraine is not able to cope with the huge losses it has had during last year, because uh, we have to remember, and it's also important to remember the objectives of the Russians. The Russians have, I mean, Vladimir Putin in, in particular, has never said he would occupy or invade or take over Ukraine. He set two objectives, denazification, demilitarization. These two words, in fact, he took, he took those two, two words from the Potsdam Declaration from 1945 for, that was at that time for Germany. These were, there were four objectives for uh, um, the Allies in Germany that was denazification, demilitarization, democratization, and decentralization. Now, Putin took the two first for Ukraine. And 
he made very clear in his address uh, to the, the Russians in, on the 24th of February 2022, he said, we will demilitarize and denazify the threat to the population on the Donbass. So it was not about demilitarizing the, the, the whole NATO or whatever. That was focused on the protection of the population of Donbass. The aim of denazification was reached with the encirclement of Mariupol. Mariupol was, let's say, the cradle where the Azov movement, uh, which is a neo-Nazi movement in Ukraine, was born in 2014. And that, when, when the Russians encircled that town in March uh, 2022, they said, well, the problem of denazification is solved. And on 28th of March, they said, denazification is reached. We have reached that objective. Now, demilitarization is another story because that means demilitarization of the Ukrainian armed forces. And they never stated that the objective was reached, but it was technically reached in end of May, early June 2022. Because at that point, the Western countries and Ukraine acknowledged that they depended totally on Western help or Western aid or supply or uh, ammunition, meaning that their, all their uh, um, military capabilities were exhausted already in May, June 2022. And since then, it's the flow of ammunition and equipment that came in the, in the first wave was more old, former Soviet Union equipment that was still left in Eastern European countries that was provided to Ukraine, old tanks and things that had been refurbished or modernized, but still um, Soviet tanks ex-Soviet, even the Swedes had uh, armored uh, fighting vehicles they purchased just at the end of the Cold War, and they sent that to Ukraine. So in the first, the first batch of equipment was made by these ex-Soviet uh, Warsaw Pact equipment. And then came the Western equipment with technology a little bit more, uh, technologically a little bit more advanced, um, better performance and uh, better equipment probably, but equipment the Ukrainians were not familiar with. So they had to be trained, especially for that equipment. Uh, they had to learn to use that. I mean, and that's not, that's, that's not uh, uh, trivial um, because even the New York Times reported at the time that the Ukrainian soldiers had to look at the handbooks for using this equipment with <laughs> Google translation. <laughs> so that shows that on the battlefield you had those soldiers struggling with translating field manuals and things like this. Meaning that the equipment that was provided, which is a huge amount of material, uh, equipment, armaments and ammunition, didn't really make the difference because people were not familiar with that. And the second aspect is that when you have a kind of patchwork type of army with equipment that were not designed to work with each other, with, with each other you, you cannot integrate that into of a system. While the Russians, even if they have equipment that still probably a little bit obsolete, although they have a lot of modernized equipment, they managed to, to keep a system. And their, their army, the, the army they have in Ukraine, works as one system, which everything that connects everything, artillery, infantry, drones, uh, aircraft, all that is, is integrated into one uh, system, if you want. I, I, I put it very simply, but that, that's, the, that's the, the key for the, the Russians uh, to have some kind of success.
while on the Ukrainian side, when you keep receiving equipment that was designed for British soldiers, for Swedish soldiers, for German soldiers, and all that, with different languages in those tanks, I mean, all the, everything which is uh, written in those tanks, it's written in German, in Swedish, in, you know, they have to struggle with that. So you cannot really have an integrated force. And I think that's, that's what we have witnessed with this uh, counteroffensive that started early June this, this year, that the, the Ukrainians never managed to use the equipment that was provided to them in a completely integrated and completely, let's say, efficient way. Putin went into the war with cash reserves, hard currency reserves, with a trade surplus, so he had a war chest. It seems as though the West is suffering more from increased oil prices or increased grain prices. Are sanctions hurting Russia or has that boomeranged? Well, they did hurt Russia, but not with the magnitude we expected. Meaning that they, within weeks, they could manage the problem, basically. The essence is that Russia Despite having an industrial production, it's not exactly what uh, John Cain, uh, McCain used to say, that uh, Russia is uh, just a, a, a pump station or uh, gas station. It's not exactly that. Russia has, uh, uh, is uh, one of the leading producers of um, uh, nuclear power plants, for instance, has uh, uh, huge uh, uh, activities in high-tech uh, area. Uh, we see now, uh, for instance, these uh, hypersonic missiles that the U.S. have not been able to produce so far. Mm. So, and, and Russia have that see, since about 10 years. Uh, and that was also the same thing during the Cold War. We, and we, we keep under, underestimating the capabilities of the Russians in terms of technology. That's one point. But <clears throat> the second thing is that besides that, it's a fact that Russia provides resources, cheap resources, to the West, like gas, or oil, and things like this. Now, if you put those resources under sanction, meaning that essentially what you are doing is to, to reduce the market, the price will rise. I mean, it's, it's just mechanical. It's just a supply and demand law. If you just shorten the supply, the price will raise. And we, we, we have exactly that problem today. Trying to take Russia out of the oil market and taking uh, uh, Russia out of the gas market has just created a tendency to, to uh, uh, promote inflation in our countries. By the way, it's interesting to see that the Europeans uh, went further than the Americans because last year, uh, no, it was in 2021, as uh, there were some ideas about uh, sanctioning Russia and all that, Janet Yellen, who is the, the Secretary of Treasury, she tried to discourage the Europeans to take sanctions on the energy uh, uh, issues, because he said you will completely disrupt the market. But the Europeans didn't want to listen to that. They were, and, and that's, that's something which is also very interesting in this conflict, is that from the Western side, we, we don't see a conflict that is driven by facts. It's a conflict which is driven by ideology or driving, driven by hope. I could even say, because we hope that the Russians will collapse. We hope that they will lose that war. We hope that the Ukraine will, will win. We, it's, it's not based on fact. It's just based on preconceived ideas, on suspicions, on hypothesis. But there is no real fact-based decision. And that, is, is, I think, is extremely uh, worrisome for observers.
uh, like me, for instance. <laughs> I think one issue that certain talking about ideology and preconceived ideas, I, I, there, if in in Western media there seems to be a consensus that this war will somehow divide Putin's support in Russia and lead to his ultimate demise, but that does not seem to be happening. Even if people don't like the idea of war, they kind of feel as though the people are under attack rather than. Well, that was the idea. That was the whole idea. I mean, th again, it's, it's, it's a hope-based strategy because we figured out that since we believe that Putin is a dictator, nobody likes a dictator. Hence, the Russian population must hate Putin. And in fact, if you look at the polls, and I refer, I mean, there are many different Paul uh, Institute in, in Russia. All of them are consistent in saying that the support to Putin has not really changed. And in fact, the support to Vladimir Putin has increased since the beginning uh, of the war in, in, uh, in, or the beginning of the special operation, special military operation in February uh, 2022. So, but, the idea of sanctioning, right, because it's also interesting, we had a very interesting interview of the French uh, Minister of Industry in early March 2022, where he said the aim is to make Russia to collapse, and for that we'll target the Russian population. So the, the idea was that we target the population we remove everything that they like to have, like McDonald's or Starbucks or whatever. And so the people would then promote a regime change because they are unhappy with the government and so on. So. That was the idea. But it's based on a very poor understanding of the Russian mentality. Russians are extremely patriotic. And that was even the case during the Cold War. You had most of the Russians hated the communist regime, but they loved Russia. And for them, it was sometimes difficult to make the difference between accepting the regime and, uh, or, or fighting the country. Because the sense of the motherland in, in, in Russia is extremely strong, extremely strong. And that's something which, it, it's, it's totally different from what we see in, in the West. Since uh, March 2022, you, you, you keep that, that figure. 75% of the population supports the operation in, uh, in, in Ukraine. This is beginning to sound a little bit like an, uh, an apologist for, for Russia, the, the reference to the unelected government in Ukraine, et cetera. How do we get, uh, and that's, that's a different perspective, obviously, how, how do we get the reality here? Because we have the Western perspective in the media, we have the Russian perspective in the media, we have Europe and ancillary countries. Where's, where is the reality here? Well, we play with words here. When I say non-elected, it was non-elected. That's a fact. It was non-elected. In 2014, what happened, in fact, we have to go a little bit backwards. As Ukraine tried to get closer to European Union, Yanukovych noticed, I mean, the government of Yanukovych noticed that most of the Ukrainian economy in fact, was tied to Russia since the Cold War. And cutting those ties and redirecting the economy towards U Europe had huge implication within the country. And that's the reason why they started to have second thoughts about the idea of be getting closer to uh, to, to European Union. And that's when, that's where the, the Russians came into the game because when the Russians consulted the Russians, the Russians said, well, we have no problem if you get closer to the Europe. But what we suggest is to have an agreement between Ukraine, European Union, and Russia so that we find a way, kind of midway, 
to accommodate both the interests of Ukraine and, of course, the interests of Russia, of, of Russia, that's definitely, but also the interests of Ukraine. And so we could allow a slow transition from this, uh, let's say, very strong Ukraine-Russia bound to something which is more open to the European Union. And that was the Russian proposal. And it was Manuel José Barroso, who was the predecessor of uh, Ursula von der Leyen at the, uh, ha heading the um, European Commission, who said, no, no way. Who said to Ukraine, there is no way. Either it's Europe or it's Russia. There is no midway. And that put a huge pressure on Yanukovych. And that's the reason why Yanukovych said, well, we have, in that case, we have to rethink the process. We keep the idea of getting closer to Europe, but it's not abandoned. The idea is not abandoned at all. But we need more time to prepare our economy. And when he said that, that was presented in Western media as that Yanukovych abandoned the idea of getting closer to Europe under the pressure of Russia. And that was wrong, it was totally wrong. And that's where you had the first, I would say, the first Maidan. The first Maidan was very popular, very peaceful, with people demonstrating peacefully in the streets, asking the government to reconsider the idea of uh, uh, getting closer to the European Union. This phase ended with a kind of agreement and then you had a second phase, a second Maidan, with those people coming from Lvov, coming from the western part of Ukraine, which were ultra-nationalists. Some say neo-Nazi, but there were some neo-Nazi among them, but they were fundamentally ultra-nationalists. And they started the idea of toppling the government. And in, on the 22nd of February 2014, finally, an agreement was reached between the, the protesters and the government. And it was agreed that Yanukovych would stay for a while, but there would be new elections and the government would be changed or not, depending on the result of the election. The change of the government was not democratic at all, didn't follow any any of the constitutional procedures that was that uh, because there are some procedures in the um, Ukrainian constitution if you have to change the government or you know things like this but that followed absolutely none of those procedures so the process started as a popular movement but ended with something which is absolutely not democratic and when I say non-elected I try to be as neutral as possible because it, it's a fact that it was not elected. At the moment, Zelensky uh, continually seems to be replacing many of his ministers and most recently the defense minister saying that he needs someone who has new approaches. There's been some commentary in the media that this is due to um, corruption and that Zelensky needs to clean up the government, his act, the political, the political circle. What do we make of these changes? Is he in trouble? I think there's a lot of discussions within the Ukraine. Uh, it's not new, by the way, it started early this year. Probably one of the most uh, interesting aspect of that is because of the Battle of Bakhmut. Uh, because the, the chief of the armed forces, General Zaluzhny, suggested that the Ukrainian army should abandon Bakhmut because it was just not worth the losses, the UN uh, losses for that, and regroup and counterattack for some minutes. But Zelensky, for political reason, especially towards the West, to show that they will defend every single inch of the territory, Zelensky kept pouring soldiers in Bakhmut. And that was disastrous for the Ukrainian army. 
and all the military, I mean most of the military, not all, but most of the military um, was affected by this and started to question the legitimacy of, of the government. That's the first aspect. Now, since um, early this year, we talk, and in fact since last year, because the, this famous counteroffensive was announced by um, Zelensky in July 2022. And in July, he had no weapons to do it, and uh, those weapons were destroyed as soon as they came on a battlefield by the Russians. So, meaning that he never reached the critical mass to launch this offensive. Eventually, early this year, end of last year, the Western countries sent a lot of equipment to have finally uh, this uh, counteroffensive launch, and that was supposed to, to take place in early May um, this year, uh, early April, sorry, if we believe the uh, leaked uh, document, the uh, document of the, this Pentagon papers <laughs> that were leaked in, uh, in February last year, uh, this year. So this, this uh, counteroffensive should, should have taken place in um, early April, it didn't, and it was delayed until early June. The idea was to have a kind of a shock effect against the Russians, to create some panic in, uh, in the Russian army, uh, and this, uh, the, the, the Zelensky even described the, the strategy as really surprising the Russian army so that people would just f flee and, and leave the, the, the door open to the Azov war, to Melitopol and Crimea. And that would be an easy piece of cake to, to take, to retake the, 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 the lost territories up to Crimea. The reason he thought that is that last year, you may remember that in early September, Ukrainians launched an offensive in the Kharkov region, and within days, they recovered a huge amount of territory. The same happened early October in the Kherson area. This was portrayed in the Western media and in Ukraine as a huge victory and, and a demonstration that the operational art of Ukraine was superior to the operational art of Ukraine, of Russia. That's a total misinterpretation. In fact, what happened both in the case of Kharkov and Ikhilson, was that the Russians noticed that these areas, and in fact in July last year, in my previous book, I showed a map that showed the density of troops in those regions by the Russians. And this was the lowest density of troops, meaning that this was the, the two areas where the Russians paid the less attention to. They had no interest in keeping that. And that's exactly what they made early September, early October. They said, well, this would be too expensive in terms of human lives and, and equipment and all that to defend these areas. It's better to withdraw, to regroup, to have a shorter front line that they used to have before. And so they started to withdraw these troops. And in fact, in both cases, both in Kharkov and Kherson, Ukraine attacked basically an empty area. The, the Russians had left before. There was no battle, absolutely no battle. But the Russians welcomed the Ukrainians with artillery fire. So there was no battle, but the Ukrainians suffered thousands of casualties there because the, the, the Russians withdrew, had, as I said, didn't fight, but used what the, the Russians used as a tactics, it's a tactics, basic, a tactic uh, of the uh, fire pocket. So you, you empty a pocket, you let the enemy enter, and then you just destroy it with artillery fire. That's exactly what happened.
The problem is that it was so portrayed as a success. The, the Ukrainians have tried during three months to penetrate the, def the Russian defense. They haven't done that. They, in fact, they haven't even reached the first line of defense because the Russian defense system is built as a, a kind of a surveillance area first where you try to disrupt the enemy to avoid the enemy to deploy or to, let's say, to organize itself for the battle. That's his first zone. And then you have a actually defense line that, that is fortified with pillbox, with trenches, and all, all what you need to have to have a defense system. And in case this first line of defense would be breached, you have a second line of defense, which is exactly the same with trenches, pillbox, and blah, 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 dragon teeth. But since June, in fact, the Ukrainians have not even managed to reach the first line of defense. The problem is that we, we have here a completely false understanding of, again, we underestimated the Russians and we pushed the Ukrainians because now what, what happens is that the West has put so much resources into this conflict that you want and I think that was even, uh, it was probably Ben Wallace, the um, uh, British defense minister or uh, 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 a British politician, I don't remember now. He used to say, we need to see a return on investment. A return on investment from the Russia, the Ukrainians. So we gave you things. Now, now you have to demonstrate what you give, what, what, what we can take back from that. So this is extremely cynical. Uh, approach, by the way, from the West. But that's exactly how we press and push the Ukrainians to attack. Although the, and, and within the Ukrainian establishment, there were people like General Zaluzhny who thought that Ukraine was not ready for that counteroffensive. But Zelensky pushed for it. And eventually, this, uh, after three months, it's clear that the, the, this counteroffensive is a failure. And somebody has to pay for it. So Reznikov, the Minister of Defense, is in fact paying for that failure. He couldn't let this failure happen without doing anything. He had to demonstrate something. And I think that's why that's a reason why he just fired Reznikov. Reznikov is the victim of a, let's say, ill-conceived uh, counteroffensive that was probably much premature to, to sent with poor equipment. I mean, not poor equipment because each individual equipment is good, but poor system, as I explained before. The, the, the Ukraine army is not the system that allows to perform such complex operation as a breaching operation within a fortified defense. Let's look at what the war has done to international relations, because it's having an impact on the world beyond the battlefield. On the one hand, we have the West, and we have Russia, along with people who have been called bad actors. I mean, you've got China, the BRICS, as you mentioned, Iran, Turkey. These are all places where strong guys look good. And Putin may not be winning the war, but he's not losing it yet. So or do we have a new world order here? Well, that's interesting, because the whole strategy uh, that was designed, I would say, uh, before the war and just at the beginning of this, or the, the intervention, this military intervention in uh, uh, Russian intervention in Ukraine, the idea was to isolate Russia and hence to create this collapse based on the isolation, basically. So nobody would buy anything from Russia and nobody would sell anything to Russia. And so it would collapse. That was the basic idea. The problem is that the West has the bad habit of sanctioning everybody. So when you sanction someone and you sanction countries like Iran or China or, you know, these people, first of all, they don't see exactly why they should support those who sanction them <laughs> against a third party, first of all. And second, they say, well, you know, I'm already sanctioned. So what can happen? I mean, 
basically, it's better for me trying to keep my friends or to establish new friends, take the opportunity of establishing new relationships, than supporting those who sanction me. So that's the first thing. That's the reason why you have countries like Iran, for instance, who <laughs> obviously had absolutely no interest in, in, in contributing to sanctions. The same thing for, for China. And in fact, China said it very quickly. They said, if, you, if I support 100% US or the West, we are next on the line. So why should we, that, to do, should we do that? There's no point. And in fact, during the whole year, you could see NATO now is against China. You don't really understand why the North Atlantic Treaty Organization has suddenly something to do with the China Sea. I mean, the, the, you know, this makes absolutely no sense. Anyway, so China knows it. So what's the incentive for them to align on the West? That's the first thing. Second thing is that we have seen that supporting Ukraine has a price. And we see that in Germany, I mean, the, the, they, had, they have to take energy will be more, more expensive, so that will affect the whole industrial production and so on and so forth. So for the West, it has a price. And probably the West can afford the price. But can a poor country of Africa afford the price? Probably not. So they say, why should we take part into a conflict which is far away from us, in which we have absolutely nothing to do with, contrary to our interests, where we will, we will pay the price for it, under, and, and you threaten us with sanctions if we don't do it? I mean, it's not even moral. And, and I have a duty versus my own population, so my, where is my national interest? Where is, you know? And, and, and then you, you start to understand why the, the rest of the world question that. I mean, they say, well, the Europeans, you can do whatever you want. If you're ready to pay the price, that's your thing. But we, can, we cannot afford it. The whole thing happened under the permanent threat of sanctions. You know, we have always this uh, Damocles sword on, on our head, that if you don't do that, you will be sanctioned yourself. So how, what kind of world order is that? I mean, the, the, the rest of the world questioned that. They also understood, because of the massive sanctions that were applied to Russia, in terms of um, uh, wealth, of, of individuals, but also wealth uh, uh, owned by the Russian state. This was confiscated, I uh, think like, or frozen in the best case. So smaller countries said, well, but what happens if I don't comply with, with what the West wants? So I will, I will have the same. I mean, if they do that to a nuclear power, they will probably do that on a small country like me. So for me, it's better not to have anything to do with those guys and try to redirect my political and economic tie with those who don't have sanctions as a policy. Let's take a look at the next steps in, in Ukraine. Now, you've written two other books um, last in, in, the, in 2022, Putin, Master of the Game, and Operation Z, in addition to this one, Ukraine Between War and Peace. What are the next steps? Continue the war? General mobilization? Consider a way out of the crisis? Is it too late to negotiate? What happens? What's the way out? Well, it's never too late to negotiate. The problem is under which, which terms? That's, that's the question, in fact. The special military operations started on the 24th of February last year. On the 25th, that means one day later, Zelensky asks for negotiations with the Russians. And the Russians say, okay, we negotiate, no problem. But the European Union came and said, no. Came to you, Zelensky said, no. You don't negotiate, you fight. Here are 450 million 
euros for weapons and you fight. One month later, mid-March 2022, Zelensky made a proposal to the Russians. And we have the text of that propo proposal. I mean, that was published at the time and, and Putin showed it to a delegation of the African Union uh, just a few weeks ago. We know what, what uh, uh, Zelensky proposed. He proposed that the Russians would leave the country, except Donbass and Crimea, which were subjected to separate negotiations. The, the, the Ukraine would not be member of NATO. There would be a kind of neutral status for Ukraine under supervision of some states and blah, blah, blah. The Russia said, OK, we are interested in that. They started to negotiate on that document. They have the proposal signed by the, the, the head of the Ukrainian delegation. What happened? European Union came, said no. They told to Zelensky, you are not going to negotiate. Boris Johnson came, I said Boris, <laughs> the Russian <laughs> way, I should say Boris. <laughs> Boris Johnson came and said, you're not going to. And even the Ukrainian press, said that the obstacle to peace were the Europeans. The Ukrainian press, and that was Ukrainska Pravda, if I'm not wrong, who made an article explaining that the obstacle to peace were the Westerners. So that's what happened. There was a third attempt in August last year, um, under the auspices of Tayyip Erdogan, he went in on visit to, um, to Ukraine and proposed a meeting with, with, uh, between Zelensky and Putin. And Putin accepted. But Boris Johnson came again and said, it's not the time for flimsy peace plans or something like that. But those times are changing. I mean, Boris Johnson isn't in power anymore. And True. That's this... correct. That's correct. But I mean, what I mean with that is that the West, basically, I mean, the negotiation is possible. If we had done that one year ago, it would be on terms, I mean, the Russians would have left the country, would have left Ukraine. Today, and that's why I'm saying under which terms, because today, it's almost unthinkable to have a negotiation where the Russians would say, we leave the country. Well, unless maybe they had autonomous regions, but that doesn't seem to be in the interests of the Ukrainians or the West. If it, within Ukraine there were autonomous regions. Well, well, well we, we, can, we can see the details of that and how this could, the, the, you, could, you could shape that. But essentially, the Russians will stay. And they will, the, if there is a negotiation, it's based on the situation we have today. And based on the fact that the West refused negotiation last year under better terms. So negotiation is always possible. The problem is that now the West is in fact prisoner of its own narrative. Everybody said for one and a half year that Russia has lost and Ukraine has won and all that. So today, if we come to a negotiation, we see that it's not the case of a victory of, of Ukraine and a, a defeat of, of Russia. And that's why, in fact, there were some expectations from the counteroffensive, because they expected that the counteroffensive would bring some success. And that success could be then exploited in a negotiation, saying, well, we have success and we negotiate on the base of this success and things like this. But OK, this didn't happen. Today, you have to negotiate, but you have to negotiate from the position of the one who is defeated, not the one who is winning. That's the thing. And then you have another aspect. Uh, that, that, uh, that's very much uh, uh, the case of, I mean, not, not only U.S., but, but especially U.S., because you have a presidential election. And as we feel, the Biden administration is not very keen 
to drag this conflict into the presidential campaign. Mm -hmm. They would like to have some kind of solution before that. That's why they pressed Zelensky to have this counteroffensive and thing. Problem is that the expectations are not met. So that means that we have to find a solution. And, and now we are taken between two things. Between the idea that we have claimed that Ukraine was winning and we are not. We claim that we will not negotiate and now we are forced to negotiate. Today the problem is, uh, is, is in fact how to avoid losing face <laughs> or avoid losing too much face. And that's exactly what, what's, what, what we are what we're witnessing in the, in the West. In addition to that, we are back to the very beginning of this discussion because the West is no longer able to provide or to supply equipment to Ukraine. I mean, in the last communique from the, uh, the Pentagon, the DOD, uh, uh, as to the, 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 the weapons delivered to Ukraine, Interestingly enough, they don't mention quantities anymore. They used to do that last year. They used it, well, so many hundred thousand uh, uh, shells uh, or rockets. Uh. Today, they just say rockets. <laughs> they don't say the quantities. They don't mention critical equipment, like Patriot missiles or the anti-missile anti thing. They don't mention it anymore because they don't have any more to share or to, to, to deliver. So a lot of equipment are missing in, in the own equipment. And, and there is an interesting study that was uh, done by the, the CSIS, um, which is um, a, a think tank, a bipartisan think tank in DC, in Washington DC. And they, they made some calculation of how long it would take for the US to rebuild their, their stocks of, of ammunition. And for some critical ammunition, it will take more than seven years to restock the, we the weapon they provided to Ukraine. Meaning that we have reached a limit. And everybody, both in the, in the West, I mean, the, the case of Belgium that made the announcement so yesterday on the, uh, on the news, they said, Belgium has no munition anymore to, to provide to Ukraine. We have no, no longer. Meaning that we are forced to find a way out. The problem is that nobody thought about it because everybody was so convinced that Ukraine, Ukraine would win and Russia would collapse that nobody spent even a minute to think about a way out. And now we are forced to find that. So that's the challenge of the next month. But there is always a way in negotiations. I'm convinced about that. The problem is what you are ready to accept because now you are doing that from the weak position and not from the strong position. Topic for your next book. The book is called Ukraine Between War and Peace. It's published in English by Max Milo Editions. Chagpold, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.